Hello and welcome to The Big Question, a new monthly podcast series where we explore a range of perspectives on the major themes guiding the economy and markets longer term. I'm your host, John Briggs. AI has burst on the scene the last couple of months, creating a furor of speculation about how this technology could change our lives for better or worse. Given the theme of the Big Questions podcast is to take a step back and look at the larger themes influencing us longer term, there feels like no better subject for the moment. We may only be able to scratch the surface today, but I fully expect we are going to return to the impact of AI further down the road in the weeks and months ahead. To help us explore the impact of AI on businesses, markets, and the world, I'm very pleased to be joined by David Grunwald. David is Director of Innovation and Partnerships at NatWest Group leading a team that's focused on driving purpose-led solutions, products, and experiences through partnerships and co-development with entrepreneurs and innovators. He joined the bank in late 2022 from a boutique venture capital firm and was previously Vice President of Innovation at the retail platform Farfetch, where he focused on startup investments, acceleration, platform strategy, and strategic projects, including Farfetch's founding membership in Meta's Libra Stablecoin project. Earlier, David was Global Head of Partnerships at Google for Startups, and previously led partnership development for ads and EMEA. He has found, founded three technology businesses, spent a number of years as a management consultant advising on digital strategy. David, thank you again for joining us. Great to be here. Okay. So first, as I noted, AI, specifically generative AI, has exploded onto the scene. But these technologies, and there's a growing number of them, so I know this is a very general term, even, even at this level as we just start talking about it, They've been around in various forms for some time, but this isn't something that just happened overnight. So just to start out, set the table, why is AI gaining so much popularity or momentum right now? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. So this isn't new. Um, traditional AI based on pre-programmed rules and algorithms um, that perform specific tasks has been around for quite a while. That's that's services that require pattern recognition or logical deductions and, and things like clinical support decisions um, used in healthcare. So we've gone through this journey of AI to ML to deep learning to Gen AI. And I guess even the current Gen AI wave, which first hit the headlines in November or December was foreshadowed. So um, the concept of a, of a GPT, a generative pre-trained transformer, which unlocked the current LLM wave has been around since OpenAI launched it in 2018. Um, the transformer bit was first described in 2017 by Google Brain, which is Alphabet's in-house lab. And, um, you know, even last summer, DALI 2, which is a graphical LLM, was the toast of my kids. Um, you might remember back in, I think it was July last year, when um, a Google engineer called Blake Lemoyne, uh, working on it, went public saying it's sentient um, and was rapidly fired soon after that. So this has been around for a while even though it was, I think, November when, um, when really this began to hit public imagination. And I, I think that's because individuals, even those who really struggle to understand technology, can personally experience the power of artificial intelligence. It's free, accessible, and the results look like magic. And um, ChatGPT, which version 3.5 was the LLM in question um, back in November, took five days to acquire a million users and, and two months to acquire hundreds million users and, and it took 16 years for mobile phones to obtain the same number and 75 years for landlines so this is moving very quickly um my, my view is it tapped into societal fear and wonder which is because on the first glance it's so human-like um it's scarily good um which did lead to this hyperbole from journalists and influencers so um, Bill Gates uh, said it was an import as important as the printing press. Um, and there have been all sorts of headlines around ChatGPT being prompted or being jailbroken to fall out and threaten users. Um, we've seen examples of companies like Samsung losing proprietary data to this thing. So it's generated a bit of swirl, it's fair to say. Sam Altman, who is the CEO of OpenAI, has made a bunch of comments um, that range from this thing is going to generate great companies, but it will kill humanity. And I'm paraphrasing here to um, this is the next big industrial revolution. But no one really fundamentally knows how this works. Um, I, I guess uh, from a business standpoint, um, we're trying to take a more sober assessment of uses and um, understand the various applications out there and how they can be leveraged. But um, it's no wonder where you've got models that are producing songs, you know, the fake Drake that went around the Internet. Um, a while back, um, deep fake audio clips, Steve Jobs talking about the COVID pandemic, um, you know, years after he passed away, 
um, it's no wonder that's that's attracting attention. Yeah, and I'm going to come back to a few of those things you mentioned just when we talk about potential opportunities and risks. But I like how you put that societal fear and wonder and combining that with free. And yeah, that's the recipe for <laughs> and cheap data storage behind it, right? And that's the recipe for a pretty quick adaptation. Um, so I want to read you something that was recently in the New York Times. And this is quoting now. In 2013, researchers at Oxford University published a startling number about the future of, of work. 47% of all U.S. jobs, they estimated, were at risk of automation over some unspecified number of years, perhaps a decade or two. Well, we're a decade on, and we're seeing similar prognostications when it comes to AI about whole businesses, whole industries. Yet, when you look back at that one, 10 years later, the U.S. unemployment rate, just use it as an example, was until recently at historic lows. You know, I tend to think of these things, you know, yes, yeah, there's always going to be winners and losers, you, know, you and I, we were talking about this podcast, talked about you know the railroad industry. Yeah, if you were taking care of horses, it was pretty bad, but it sparked a whole new wave of engineers and steel and construction and telegraph lines that ran along the railroad. Like, you know, so we hear all these doomsday predictions. And I see a lot of similar arguments about how whole professions are going to just disappear. So I guess besides that prognostication, I have two questions, two questions for you. When it comes to these kind of prophecies and AI. How much of that is hype and how much is reality? And second, with any important change, like I said, there's gonna be winners and losers, but should we be afraid of sweeping changes across any particular industries? Really interesting. So look, the first thing to say is this isn't all hype by any means. So Goldman have uh, predicted, um, I think this is a couple of months ago in April, that Gen AI could raise global GDP by 7% based on labour productivity. Um, and that there are 300 million jobs that could be exposed to uh, automation worldwide. Um, but with um, all new technologies, there'll be new roles and occupations um, created. So um, uh, Sixty percent of today's workers are employed in occupations that didn't exist in 1940, according to the Economist. Um, and look, prompt engineering is as new today as social media manager or drone operator was in 2010. So this is not something that's new. Um, what's clear is that we will all, in professional and personal contexts, be exposed to and interact with Gen AI in the not too distant future. Um, and um, my view is that it will augment humanity to the most part. I mean, it will replace some um, clearly. And, and actually the US labor market statistics, I think last month did show a small number of jobs being specifically um, removed because of Gen AI. And that, that's only gonna grow. Um, BT announced 55,000 job losses in the UK by 2030 as it moves into AI based on becoming more efficient, more digitized. Um, Citigroup is cutting jobs as a result of AI automation. Um, and I guess what's notable there is these announcements haven't universally gone down well with investors or stakeholders. It may be too early. However, if you're in, I guess, computer graphics or low value copywriting or SEO or potentially SEM or some of these newer jobs, um, or someone who reviews ultrasounds for nasty disease imprints, which was an early example of LLMs doing their thing for skin cancer, um, you, you probably are concerned. And the difference between these jobs and those previously displaced is that these are higher order work. You know, it's not loom operators in the industrial revolution context or train drivers that have already been automated. Um, this is, you know, th this is um, knowledge workers. Um, so um, that's the, I guess, the case to be concerned. The majority of implementations so far are co-pilots, um, as Microsoft calls their product. This is augmenting humanity and um i don't think um we're in the realm yet of widespread job displacement it's interesting that ba uh, bt's announcement was very forward facing um I, I think we are in a bit of a a bit of a growing um venture bubble attached to this um and this reflects the um position in the hype cycle here um and to your point about how much of its reality how much is hype I'll ask listeners or viewers to answer that for themselves. When a French Gen AI startup that was a matter of weeks sold raised $113 million in a seed round um, based on no product, just hiring staff and a brand name. And when I was building startups, the seed round was 500K. Um, NVIDIA shares are up uh, over 200% this year to a trillion market cap. They've joined the, the likes of Alphabet and Apple at that valuation. 
So there is a huge amount of hype here. Um, it's going to take some time to play into widespread job destruction. I think there's a view that there is likely to be some displacement. Yeah, I particularly liked how the, the prompt engineer, which I've certainly learned a lot about since I've been investigating this, because in my role as a data analyst, I sometimes find that the hardest challenge is not, you know, the data itself, but asking the right question. So, you know, that certainly seems like something that um, I think a lot of us, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but could certainly use. Um, so the other thing is, you know, when you think about what you said about how away from some industries, we should all maybe think about this, perhaps not necessarily with fear, but and how can AI replace me? But if you want to make yourself a little bit more um, reliable or perhaps going forward, how can I use AI to make me more efficient, right? Of course, I'm a strategist who does a lot of writing, so I'm going to think of it that way and not the other way. Um, but away from that, let's talk about opportunities in general. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a ton of potential applications. You could bring significant benefits for businesses, the wider economy and all of that. Uh, but frankly, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, so if you're you know, a business leader or in business, um, where is there some kind of framework or even just some guiding principles that if you're walking in and you're a group of business leaders that you would suggest to help them understand how and whether these technologies can help them and help achieve their goals and like how do you get your head around this from a very beginning standpoint yeah great question so um gen ai it has to be understood as a nascent technology with bumps so the first thing to do is be cautious um appreciating that it, it, it is likely to be a game changer but it's not quite there yet and the um I, I think when it comes certainly to industries that are highly regulated, like finance, um, we're in very early days. I was at Money 2020 Europe uh, a couple of weeks ago, and there was not an overarching narrative of Gen AI is going to change the world. Um, it will come, I'm, I'm fairly sure, but it's too soon for certain industries. Um, it's also not fully mature enough to replace humans in most situations. I mean, you, you really expose yourself to risk there. So. Uh, for a start, and, and relating back to Sam Altman's comments, and this is widely observed, no one really understands how AI makes decisions. This is the nature of a neural network that is black box. Um, so there's no transparency, and that's going to be problematic for regulated business where, you know, uh, habitually organizations supply algorithms to regulators to examine. Um, and in the consumer context, or in on just the, the world of humans interacting with computers, um, we're seeing examples of for example, an eating disorder helpline that disabled its chatbot due to bad advice. Um, so, as I said earlier, the, the main um, initial focus here is using Gen AI as an assistant that can offer real benefits. Um, so it might level the playing field for workers with neurodiversity. Um, or, uh, it might um, offer an advantage at work to programmers that are able to debug software more easily. Um, so thinking about the primary considerations, I, if, if, if I was viewing this as a business, I would um, go, go back to first principles. The, many of these relate to any new technology that comes along. So before choosing a technology, understand your adoption cost, uh, assess the costs, the workload required to implement it, and understand the benefits that need to compensate for those costs. And, and appreciate that actually some of the Costs could be unforeseen at this point. Um, understand the risk. It, it ensure you're fully aware of the security and privacy risks attached to this. Know that if you are submitting things to public uh, models like ChatGPT, they're going to end up in a mush of public cloud or in someone else's private database. Uh, and this is the Samsung engineer example I used earlier. Um, understand your uh, user needs and what capability would be required to implement the new technology to meet those needs. Um, again, basic, but think about interoperability and integration. Um, the API layers attached to these models are not fully developed yet. You're seeing the rise of app stores. Uh, OpenAI announced its ambition, I think, a couple of days ago to have a fully fledged app store, but GPT agents that plug into different things. How easy is it or difficult is it to connect with other technologies that are already in your business? And Think broadly about the ecosystem around this. What can, where could it go? Uh, is the technology ecosystem um, going to be rich? And can you create new services off the back of the technology? And, and finally, think culturally. Think about the relationship between your customers and what they're interacting with. Um, think about that displacement point. Is taking a human away and introducing a computer safe? 
What does it do to your corporate culture? What does it do to the staff that might be augmented or could be replaced? Um, so there's a myriad of things to think about. And I, I don't think they're new to Gen AI. What is different here is the level of uncertainty about the technology at this point. Yeah, it's interesting. The the kind of part of me says when you hear when you talked about, you know, perhaps people with different disabilities being able to use an assistant, you really can get bring in more people into the workforce that maybe perhaps were marginalized or excluded or had difficulty. That's that's pretty interesting. But also related when it comes to risks, this is another two-part question. Is there a risk that AI will simply, you know, automate some of the many biases that are built in the system? You know, I mean, if it's it is kind of, you know, human adjacent, so to speak. Um, you know, it, I mean, there's countless stories about companies that with the best intentions unconsciously, you know, code or program things for credit cards that, you know, score some groups less than others. And, you know, you know, can't necessarily determine where it came from. But, you know, so is there a chance that um, many of our biases get kind of automated or integrated in this? Or do you think it actually can solve some of that? And then on the regulatory side, and I think with the, the lens of kind of the crypto environment we've seen and the speed of that, can regulators actually keep up with some of this stuff? Yeah, look, I think we've mentioned some of the risks already. Um, and the the automation of biases is, is really clear. I, I guess that's the pre-trained point um, in the word GPT or the acronym GPT. Um, OpenAI trained its data on the open internet. And the open internet is reflective of the gamut of human experience and if you are pointing a model at training data based on reddit and twitter it's going to end up with some slightly skewed um approaches and perspectives and that we've seen in uh, lesser ais over the years that biases that accidentally creep in are often amplified but here you're training it on tokens on huge amount of data that reinforces that algorithmic bias as well so that there is definitely a problem um attached to that. I think I, I point to other pitfalls you should look out for. Um, I mean, the hallucination point um, is key. This is the notion that it might give you things that sound correct that aren't correct. The, the notion of LLMs as stochastic parrots, as they've known, as, as they're often referred to. Um, you've then got, you know, the um, power of um, graphical LLMs or video LLMs to create deep fakes. Um, mentioned the Steve Jobs example, but actually a lot more darkly and a lot less trivially, um, a very large proportion of deep fakes that have gone to court are pornographic. I think it's something like 96%. Um, and that's typically non-consensual, which is, which is hideous and is a growing risk here. Um, I think there's another risk I point to, which you didn't specifically allude to, which is more profound in some ways than, and, and less specific, but what happens when the marginal cost of creative production declines to zero? What happens when everything is derivative and the sum total of human knowledge and experience and creativity ceases to evolve and is just reflective of what happened before? So again, a little bit more philosophical. Um, turning to your question about regulators. Um, so regulations uh, are needed, I think, for transparency, explainability and accountability to allow scrutiny of these systems. Um, and there is a basic safeguarding point for humans, for intellectual property, for, for privacy um, that is required. This, I think, is a very classic example of a technology that's ahead of the regulators. Um, and different markets have tried to tackle this in different ways. Um, so the US approach to AI risk management is highly distributed across federal agencies um, that are uh, adapting to AI potentially without new legal authority. Um, the EU has gone blanket. Um, it has proposed the EU AI Act that will govern the use of AI in a way that is um, really quite broad and it's expected to be adopted. Um, however, that could be constraining. I mean, I mean, who knows? But um, Sam Altman has uh, said that um, OpenAI um, could be limited in the EU market as a result of these um, regs. The UK is going sector by sector. It's not got an overarching AI regulator. It doesn't have plans for one, as I understand it, um, but is trying to allow different industries to choose their own path here based on some core principles. Um, and has also, um, has also announced that it's going to hold a global summit this fall to discuss AI regulation, which is something it's got backing from uh, US and other jurisdictions to do. And I think uh, the UK is trying to take a leadership role here 
Um, I, that's that's sort of high level industrial policy base, but it's, it could be quite useful to base that in a in an economy like the UK that has a big um, research uh, as well as fintech base to it. So there's a lot happening. I, as I alluded to earlier, um, some of the financial regulators around the planet demand that financial institutions provide um, transparency to their algorithms that allow you know for basic financial decision making to happen. Very hard to do that in this context where the algorithms are black box themselves. So there's a lot to do to get um, the, the regulatory world um, uh, up to date with where we are now versus you know where this could go, which is a you know it, it's mind boggling and quite exciting, but also a little bit terrifying. I'd, I'd add one last piece to that. We haven't talked about IP actually um, at this point, which is the, the the basic problem that if you're generating outputs based on inputs, you might be um, we probably are um, uh, not playing by the fair use rules, whether enshrined in law or common law, that um, govern ownership of copyrights. And there is a whole body of, of, of law that's required to even just deal with that basic facet of a model that is derivative. It uses inputs of existing content to generate outputs that looks like that content. Yeah, and sourced from everywhere. Um, yeah. So again, from a business standpoint, well, let me just say, you know, you mentioned deep fakes a few times. I mean, as as a citizen in a very polarized political environment in the U.S., there's a lot of reasons that scares me. But I'm going to put that to the side for the moment and just say, even from a from a business perspective, you mentioned the um, you know voice cloning and things like that. It's it's rife for fraud. You know, it's rife for um, a, a cloned CEO voice to make instructions to, you know, uh, their, whether it's to, to wire money or to do, make certain decisions or to do certain things. And so, um, you know, what are steps that businesses can take or just start thinking about to ensure their resilience for that kind of thing in this environment? Yeah, look, I think the first thing to say is, um, keep people in the mix at this point, um, because it's often easier for a human to tell something than a machine, especially a well-trained human. Um, so, I mean, there are telltale signs that can distinguish between um, a machine-generated deep fake um, and something that's legitimate. Um, there are tools to develop deep fakes that are improving, and often they're um, uh, LLM-based themselves. So you pit essentially um, white hat versus red hat um, in hacker language. So you you um, equip an LLM to understand what another LLM is doing, which is uh, interesting and, and is already evolving. There's a longer term play here, which I've heard cited, which is the notion of digital watermarking, potentially involving um, blockchains or uh, DLT technology. Mm. Um, and that is where a piece of material, piece of digital content uh, is real whether it's an image or a document or a piece of writing um, embedding invisible to human watermarks to show it's real and linking that to a trust model that dlt infrastructure could enable um, we're not there yet i think it's a potentially a very powerful use of dlt technology that hasn't yet found a use um, in, in other uh in other ways so th there's there's a lot to do here i think it's definitely something that's worrying um, the infosec community right now. Yeah, it's interesting that you could definitely see some blockchain type solutions to some of these some of these problems. I think this is going to continue to evolve, obviously. And as I noted in the beginning, I think that we're going to be digging a little deeper into some of these subjects more specifically, how they impact businesses and investors and markets, you know, in, in future pods. So um, okay, again, this is such a broad table setting, but there's a lot to think about even here. So thank you again for, uh, for joining me on this podcast today. Not at all. It was great fun. Thank you for having me. Great. And to our listeners, be sure to follow us on social media to get other episodes in the series the moment they're published. If you like what you heard today, please hit that like button so it's easier for others to find. Thank you. And we'll talk to you next time.